Hello, I'm Simon, Simon Headley, and welcome to today's episode of Pause, Stop, Reset. Today, I'm looking forward to speaking with Amy Hackett-Jones. My first conversation with her and every interaction since, I have been bowled away, not only by her truly inspiring experiences, some of which you'll find hard to believe even if they were in the movies, but also by her humility and her humanity. She's someone I can't wait to introduce you to, and I hope we get to spill some of her secrets. So with that said, Amy, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Simon. And what an intro. Thank you. <laughs> well, it's all true. And um, hopefully in this conversation today, people listening get a sense of why I'm saying that and why I mean that. Uh, let's start with the basics. For people that may not know you yet or haven't kept up with you and what you're doing now, who are you and what are you focused on? So my clients tend to call me the peace whisperer. And that is a nickname I got when I was working in Panama. And the Latinos are very bubbly and full of life and absolutely love them. But they don't very often know how to be very quiet. And so quite often I would sit and listen to them, uh, often only asking one or two questions in an entire hour of coaching them. And so I became known as the Peace Whisperer because I was able to get them to a place of peace with a, literally a couple of questions. And that became... One of my most powerful tools was helping people to create a sense of inner peace within them, given all of the hurly-burly of life and everything that it throws at us. So yeah, that was my nickname. And what am I working on? I'm currently working on a couple of things. One is my coaching business, which I actually don't advertise. People come to me and through recommendations mostly. And that's just the way I like it because it has a more peaceful ring to it. <laughs> See what I mean? Um, and the other thing I'm working on is an ed tech platform in which I am the chief operating officer, which sounds very officious. And we're building a platform to help people develop their character. And so whilst I might be working on a micro level one-on-one -on -one with my clients, I'll be working on a macro level with the platform when we get it launched. Very clear. And as I said, you are quite humble about things you've done and things you're up to. We'll get more of that, I think, as we go on. So let's get into the meat of pause, stop, reset. If you look back on your life till now, What's been the biggest shifts and resets you've been through? I have a couple. One of them was a skiing accident I had when I was 21. I fractured and crushed all my lumbar vertebrae and broke my right hip in three places. Was airlifted off the slopes and ambulanced all the way back to London. And the doctors basically said to me, you'll never run again. Now, I've always been athletic. I was never going to be an Olympian, but I've always competed at a, a county level. And that for me in that moment, the only place my mind could go at that point is, well, you might as well just chop off my legs then. Because being athletic meant so much to me. It was really a part of who and what I identified with. And so after six months in bed and a Zimmer frame and crutches and learning to walk again, I realized that I wasn't going to be able to do a lot at that point because I'd bought into what the doctors told me. So I did a bit of yoga here and there, but I found a job in the meantime that paid me to travel the world, interview heads of state of third world countries. So I sort of forgot for quite some time about being athletic as I was distracted doing other really cool fun stuff, <laughs> which I'll come back to in a minute. And I was sent to South Africa in 2006, and I was there for about six months. And one morning I had to get from Johannesburg to Cape Town, a flight away or otherwise an 18 and a half hour drive. And unfortunately, there were no flights left. And I had to get to the World Economic Forum the next day to interview the president, Thabo Mbeki at the time. And because there were no flights, I ended up having to drive overnight. Lots of coffees and Red Bulls later, I did arrive in Cape Town very early in the morning and decided that I wanted to go for a walk the sun was rising. So I went for a walk around the block and then another block and then another block. And I thought, oh, I might just try jogging, given I hadn't actually run in seven years now. So I jogged around the block and then another block. And then I ended up jogging, running from Cape Town to Cape Point, which is 40 something miles. And it was just the most incredible experience because as I was running, it was, it was my forest Gump moment and the sun was rising over the Atlantic Ocean. And it was just one of those moments when I wasn't sort of even present in my body. I just felt the force of the spirit, nature, whatever you want to call it, come over me. And I just kept going. And when I got to Cape Point, that's an incredible place. It's where the Atlantic and Indian Oceans meet. And the energy there was just insane. When I got down on my knees and cried when I got there, it was just a release, such a big release because I had held on to for so many years what the doctors had said to me, that being, you will never run again. And I just realized in that moment that actually none of that was true and that the power and the strength of who I am and who my spirit is, is far and beyond what anyone in any establishment 
can actually tell you and predict for you. Now, they, they make predictions. Of course, they do, and they have to, and I, I fully honor and respect that. However, what they don't know is the strength of the spirit inside you. And so that was one of my biggest pause reset moments. And another one was when I was on a project in Panama. I'd started meditating, but didn't really know what I was doing. I was just sort of flapping around a bit with it, five minutes here, five minutes there, thinking I was doing myself a good deed. And I ended up meeting a chap who looks just like Jack Nicholson. (laughs) Hilarious. But he's actually an urban shaman. And he had studied with Native American Indians for about 30 years on and off over the years. And he spotted me. I was at the British Ambassador's Christmas Ball in Panama, as one does. And he came across to me and said that he'd like to have a chat. And I sort of thought, you know, I'm I'm quite open. I talk to anyone and everyone. I've traveled so much. You know, I've I've heard so many stories. But this guy really caught my attention. And we agreed to meet a few days later. And he told me his story. And I said, well, I'd love to introduce you to the president because I'd actually met, I'd met the president by that point and interviewed him for the project I was working on. And I said, well, if you sign a contract with him, coaching contract, I'll take 10%. Thank you very much. (laughs) And so they met. They signed a contract, I took 10%, and then we ended up setting up a business together. And that was a huge pivotal moment in my life as well, because I knew that there was a calling, that there was something deeper for me at the time. I knew that there was a path that I wasn't yet on, but somehow the universe was aligning me, calling me to meditate and calling me to, to Panama to meet this guy you know, seemingly sporadically, but actually I'm sure it was highly intentioned by the universe. <laughs> So we ended up building business together over seven years and coached, sorry, many of the le- business leaders there and political leaders in the, in the region. And yeah, it was, it was an incredible experience to learn from a shaman how to coach on the job and how to work with energy and, and healing abilities. And then that all came to an abrupt end when my mum got very sick with cancer. And I got a call one day from my brother saying, mum's collapsed. She's got 48 hours to live. So I flew home immediately and got home to mum 24 hours later so halfway through the 48 hours and she was in hospital and I held her hand and looked deep into her eyes and said I wasn't going anywhere but I loved her and she ended up living for another two and a half years so I left everything in Panama I stayed home I took care of her until she passed away and that was another huge pause stop reset moment because I was one minute living the high life in a hustling bustling Latin city coaching the president and ministers So living at home with my mum for two and a half years as she had cancer. And my brother at the same time was diagnosed with cancer. He, by the way, is still with us. My mother passed away. So yeah, I've had a few. (laughs) Just just a few. I love how you just drop in. Yeah, I just jogged 40 miles into the presence of a country. It's it's not what I do. And um, I love that about you. It's it's part of the fun. You know, you've had this rich experience and that humanity. Actually, what drives you is this sort of this family, this heart side of you as well, which is so important. One of the things we touched on with these three words, these three simple words, pause, stop, and reset, they are different aspects of life. Here, pause and carry on, you stop and Mm. it stops and the reset link brand new. Which of those do you think has been hardest for you and why do you think that was? For me, I think the stop, the actual stopping has been the hardest. I think because of my sort of athleticness, I like to keep going. I like to keep pushing boundaries. I like to, you know, after I'd done that 40 miles stint, a couple of years later, I'd started doing tri- training triathlons when I was in Panama. And then I came back to the UK after I'd taken care of mum and didn't train for two or three years, but then just thought it'd be a really good idea to do a half Ironman. And so I literally did a half Ironman with zero training. Not recommended, by the way, but I did it. <laughs> My time was respectable. But the stopping bit for me is the hardest because I can pause and reflect. I can think about things, but it's actually very hard to stop everything that you're doing and really go that much deeper than simply reflecting to to really start asking some of life's biggest questions to really start taking a step back from the hurly-burly as I said earlier and looking at what else might be possible I think the resetting for me would that is then easier because you've taken the bigger step back and you've dived that much deeper the reset for me would then be easier so I think for me the stopping is the hardest one of those three Definitely. I, I can get that. And the little break we had over the summer when you were busy with things and I've come back and you've got this, this, this on and this on. And you do seem to be never ending when you get going, which is a great skill, right? Don't recommend the burning yourself out doing triathlons on day one. And it is a challenge, which with the physical artists, with the Olympians, elite sports people, and military people, they do tend to keep going until the body breaks, the spirit doesn't. And um, yeah. that can be hard. If, if we look at sort of going back at your younger self, you know, is there a lesson or two you wish you could send your younger self? Yeah, there's a couple for sure. I think I was so, I lacked such 
confident when I was younger in myself that it was always crippling at times. I wouldn't put myself forward for things. I wouldn't put my hand up in class to say things. I wouldn't stretch myself. I'd always stretch myself physically for some reason that was, that was different in my head, I guess. But constant feeling that other people were better than me and that other people knew more than me and that other people could do more than me, that had more authority than I did to, to speak up and say things. And so for a big part of me was, of, of my journeys, not just being the physical one, but also finding my voice, which sounds kind of funny because I'm speaking now. I obviously have a voice. But I remember my shamanic teacher, Hawk, when I met him in Panama, he always used to say to me, find your voice, find your voice, find your voice, find your voice, find your voice. And I literally didn't know what he meant. I was like, but I've got a voice. But it wasn't a voice that I used powerfully. I would sort of cower in the corner of whoever I was put on the spot about anything or asked a question and told to speak up. And since I started learning with him, and he like the constant reminder. It's almost like the universe has just kept providing me with lessons to learn in that arena and spaces in which to practice. And by that, I mean, I ended up working in Panama very often with men in powerful positions. And so I had to speak up, especially if I was, if I was going to be coaching them. And then, you know, when I was back in England and after mum had passed away, I joined a company and I was on the senior leadership team and the senior leadership team were all men. And I had to find my voice around a table full of men. And so I, it was almost like I just had to keep flexing those muscles and the universe gave me every single opportunity it could for me to learn <laughs> that lesson. Um, and so for the, the younger me, it would be just to embrace life more and have more fun, definitely have more fun. And don't be afraid to be confident. Don't be afraid to know thyself as well, knowing yourself deeper on many levels. It is the greatest gift I've had over the last 20 years. What surprises me and amazes me is that kids these, these days, I'm talking you know, 18 year olds and such, my, my Goddaughters and eight, is just eighteen, and they're so much more self-aware on many levels than we were at, at that age. Um, they're ex exposed to so much more than we were, and I just think what a gift they have. You know, if they're aware of that, what a gift they have in life. They, they've got twenty years on us. So yeah, know thyself, confidence, and just have more fun. I like the having more fun one. The uh, being confident and finding a voice is something I can resonate with. I many a course on that, and it's it's still the day. The sort of tall poppy syndrome we have in the yes. UK. Yeah, yeah. And um, especially when you get around like presence of countries, like mm. they're, they're the important ones, right? Well, yes, they are. They. I was just going to add to that. They are, and I remember thinking after my second or third project in one of these countries, just thinking to myself, you know what? They're all just humans like I am. They all go to bed and have families and eat and sleep and all the rest of it. It's just the, you know, the, the name on the door that's different. And that's how I used to comfort myself and calm myself down. And the other thing I wanted to say on this subject about talking to my younger self is something I learned recently from a friend of mine who I will talk about a little bit later. We've all learned about setting intentions, but she took it one step further. She, she said to me a lot, set the intention and set it clearly, you know exactly what you find out exactly what it is you want. Set the intention and then take your hands off the wheel. Like hand it over to the universe, set the intention and hand it over. Because the more we meddle in the how, the more we step in the way rather than allow things to happen. So yeah, take your hands off the wheel. Set the intention, take your hands off the wheel. No, I really love those. They they resonate and they are hard to do at times, but um, yes, uh, they are important lessons in life, I think. And it, it brings us to our next sort of question, really. Yeah, Are sure. there any books or movies that you've read or you get drawn to that have given you inspiration, have helped you learn to do these things, learn to pause, stop and reset? So Dr. Scylla Elworthy, that's S-C-I-L-L-A, Elworthy, is an absolute heroine of mine. She's absolutely fabulous, full of presence and grace, and just one of the most incredible humans I've ever come across. She's written three books, Pioneering the Possible, Awakened Leadership for a World That Works, The Business Plan for Peace, Building a World Without War, and The Mighty Heart, which is all about having courageous conversations. And she is all about building. She has been her entire life. And she holds peace negotiations in war-torn Africa with, you know, chiefs of tribes and all sorts of things. She's, uh, she's absolutely incredible. And I just find her books extremely insightful. And she makes world peace seem possible. She actually breaks it down into numbers and facts and figures and small steps that each and every one of us can do in our day-to-day -day lives. 
And that for me is incredible because my whole premise is about peace and power and purpose of the work I do. And so, yeah, she's an absolute heroine. I really recommend watching her TED talk, getting her books, reading them because it is, it is possible. And I thoroughly believe that. And then movies, I do like Dead Poets Society, good old classic there. Just the leadership that you see in that movie is just incredible. You know, when they get up on the tables and they start believing in themselves and breaking down the, the rules of the school, etc. cetera. Um, Shawshank Redemption is another one, that search for freedom. And there's just so many quotes in that, in that movie that just really ring true. The Matrix is another one, interesting in these times that we're in right now. And then another one is Whale Rider, which is a, a small budget movie out of New Zealand, um, which is where my mum was from. And just an incredible story about Maori elders and Maori traditions. And yeah, again, breaking paradigms. They get, there's a young girl in it and she has the insight. She has that spirit within her to be the next leader of their community. But because she's a girl, she's sidelined and ignored and quite positively put down until such time as she proves herself. And yeah, it's just incredible. Great story. Thank you for sharing those and especially Dr. Scylla Elworthy with Peace is Possible. Yeah, that whole conversation is part of the reset, but actually a poor store yeah. reset. This whole thing of, well, just because it hasn't happened yet, you know, we could try that out and try something out new that's a different approach. And especially in these times, it's a reminder, you know, the gratitude we have for the simple things that we can have these conversations. And yet so many aren't doing that yet. And it's going to be yeah. hopefully within our decade ahead, uh, a difference we've made. And hopefully listening today, you'll be listening in and getting some inspiration to move you forward. And that Well Rider movie, especially one to watch, I recommend that. Uh, all of them actually great movies. What I'm just coming back to, we touched on mm. some of your, uh, your reset, some of the things you've been through. What helped you through them? If you think back to the biggest one or the most challenging ones you've had to handle, what, what helped you navigate them? What helped you through them? I think one of the biggest ones was mum passing. And, you know, one minute I was building a very successful business in a hot, hustling, bustling Latin city. And 24 hours later, I was in the middle of nowhere in rural England, taking care of my mum. And it was a decision I made in a nanosecond to stay with her. That was not the, the issue. The resetting in that point was probably the most challenging because I had to constantly, every single day, I had to reset my heart. And first thing in the morning, I, you know, I, if I was anxious or worried that I was losing mom or that she was, you know, particularly ill on one day and this, that and the other, then I knew that I had to have my heart in a place of peace before I could open the door and see her. Because if I was all stressed and then full of anguish and angst and all sorts about losing her anytime soon, I wasn't going to be helping her process. I wasn't going to be serving her. I really had to draw time that I spent looking after her. I had to draw on everything that I had learned in Panama with my shamanic teacher. Every single thing about how to create a heart of peace and to come from that place every single day and in every single interaction. And that has been really the foundation and the bedrock of the work I do now. I'd sort of, I'd done some of it before, obviously, that's where I got the name Peace Whisperer. But that was where I, that was my dojo, let's say. Is there a technique, uh, something somebody listening can try out to start that process? I know as we get older, we have those challenges with family and friends having health challenges and being with that. So is there anything somebody listening in to, can do to sort of start that heart at peace process? There's a few simple things. One of them obviously is breathing. And I don't know if you know the Iceman, Wim Hof. He's a great one to follow in terms of breathing exercises and how to calm the body down and energize it. So he's definitely one of, one of my gurus in that space. In my TED talk that I did whilst I was in Panama, I also share a meditation, which I can just walk you through it quickly now, but it's about putting your hand on your heart, closing your eyes, and again, breathing slowly. And then just over a few minutes, imagining your heart as it is right now. It's probably like a tight rosebud. Most of us walk around with our heart fairly closed and tight. And as each time you breathe in, you imagine that the rose opening up more and more with every single breath that you take in until your heart is fully open. And then when your heart is fully open, you just breathe in some more, then you can go out into the world and embrace life and take it on because your heart is fully open. And that's just, it's one of the practices I do regularly. And I can do it in a couple of seconds now because I've done it so many times. But yeah, breathing and just imagining your heart opening like a beautiful rose is really powerful. 
So that's one. Love it. And I love how you say as you get used to doing it, that reset yeah. gets easier, becomes sort of a, a comfortable pattern there. Yeah. But the people that are looking to do a shift, they're looking to reset their lives in different ways. Maybe not they're having to, maybe they're choosing to. Are there anything suggestion wise you'd love them to try out? Like if you know now what you knew, if you sort of had to do a reset, what would be your top approaches? I guess coming back to center, this breathing, this peace aspect is clearly there. Yeah, for me, that's the number one driver, because if you don't have a heart at peace as your foundation, what do you have? You know, you're operating probably from ego and ego is generally in fear most of the time. So you're reacting, not responding to situations around you. And ultimately, there's only really two emotions as fear and love. And you can put joy, happiness, the happy ones you can put under love and all the anxious ones you can put under fear. Keep things simple. It's number one. It's that you're either in fear or you're in love. And if you're in fear, you know it physiologically because your palms sweat, your heart beats faster, you, you, know, you get brain fog, etc. cetera. Um, whereas if your heart is open and at peace, then you're calm, your breathing is clear, your mind is clear, you stand in your power, you're more aligned to your purpose. And so that's one thing. Are you in fear or are you in love? And you have a choice between which one you decide to, to be in, to spend time in. Um, another thing would be to get into common unity. And by that, I mean community with people who are on a similar path. And there are more and more of us out there in the world. So find people who can keep you accountable, who are on a similar journey, who will help stretch you. You know, Jim Rohn said, we are the sum of the five people we spend most time with. So do an audit of the people you spend most time with. Who are they? Do they drag you down? You know, what are their healthy habits like if they have any? You know, Jim Rohn told a story of how, you know, even if you're the healthiest eater and eat salads all day, every day, if you hang out with people who eat McDonald's all day, every day, you will eventually over time eat McDonald's every day because that's the gravitational pull of social beings, which we are. So who are the five people you spend most time with? And if you haven't got people around you that pull you up, that inspire you, that motivate you, then go find some. Um, another thing would be to find a mentor in some way, shape or form, whether that's a coach, whether it's a mentor at work, you know, whoever it is, find a mentor, someone who will challenge you. And another point is we're all living our own hero's journey. If you think about, you know, Neo in the Matrix, or you think about Han Solo and you think about all these stories that we love and we keep going back to over and over and over again, it's because we love the hero's journey. So be the hero of your own journey. And then think about what does that look like? What do you want your story to be? How do you want it to look? What are the steps you need to take next? All of the, <laughs> the hero's journey stories that we go to the movies to watch, you know, they all have a mentor in some way, shape or form. So go find yourself a mentor, get into a community of people who uplift you would be two of the things I would suggest. I love this, Amy, and love you bringing up Jim, Mr. Jim Rohn. Yep. Um, it's, it is interesting, these dots, how they connect. And uh, we're going to have to wrap up in just a few of today's episode of Pause, Stop, Reset. I want to make sure people want to get hold of you, connect with you, can do that. What's the best way they reach out? The best way they can reach out is at Amy Hackett Jones across all social media. But I'm usually on Instagram or Facebook more than anywhere else. Or my website, Amy Hackett Jones, that's A-M-Y-H-A-C-K-E-T-T-J-O-N-E-S. Dot com or peacewhisperer.com if that's easier. There you go. Amy's keeping it simple. I love that. Reminder to keep it simple. And uh, yeah. we've covered quite a lot today. And underneath it, there is this aspect of trust, of spirit. I do want to sort of dig deep with you for a little bit, if that's okay. One last deep question with your mm. experience and reset brain. So one thing I've seen in my life the last 10 years, especially is people that have got huge heart, they are doing the work, but the big thing that's draining them is this financial side, right? So they, mm -hmm. they're great human beings, but the finances aren't working. And it's easy to say, you know, trust the process and off they go. And actually they get in the sort of quagmire of it. Is there anything around the sort of financial side that you want to suggest or recommend? Yeah, we all have a relationship with money, whether we recognize it or not. And most of us have been brought up on subconscious financial beliefs about, you know, rich people are evil or money is evil or, you know, conversations when, when we answer, you know, if somebody says, how are you? So, oh, fine, mustn't grumble. <laughs> Things like that, which is very British of us. And I just think if you had a relationship where well, you do have a relationship with money. So again, had take an audit of your relationship with money. What beliefs do you have around money? Most people, for some reason, believe that money's bad or that they shouldn't have enough of it. Or if they're spiritual, then they should be giving their abilities, their, their services away for free because it's bad to be, you know, you can't be spiritual and have money. And 
money is just money. Money is doesn't, you know, it, nothing has any meaning apart from the meaning we give it. Money is just money. It's just energy. And so if you think about it, the more you charge for your services, obviously, if you're good at what you do, the more you are able to actually deliver and the more people actually respect you. Now, I've been there as well. I've charged little to nothing for my services and I've given a lot of it away for free. And what I know to be true, and my shamanic teacher told me this years ago, and I've proved it to myself over and over and over again, is that what people get for free, they don't value. And so there's a fine line between your upper blueprint of money, you know, your, where, where you feel comfortable charging and where you're giving yourself away for too little. And then what ends up happening is you start resenting it. You start resenting the clients you do have and you start overworking and becoming energetically withdrawn. And so ultimately you're not actually delivering your best self to your best service to your best clients. So I'm a big one for really diving deep into your money story. I really, really believe that. And actually one of the best people on the planet I know for that is a friend of mine called Polly Alexander. And that's Alexander, R-E, not E-R at the end. PollyAlexander.com. She, that's, that's what she teaches is money mindset. And she's one of the best people I know out there. So go check her out. Awesome. Well, maybe you can introduce her and get her on a future episode. We are going to have to wrap up for today. I mean, thank you so much for being part of this, for being part of today's Paul Stop Reset episode. As ever, I appreciate you sharing who you are, your energy with us. And what I found most valuable is a reminder about keeping it simple, how things are either fear or love, and how sometimes other people's thoughts about the limits that you have may not be true. And you've definitely blown this out the water time and time again. And so if you've enjoyed being with us today, this episode of Paul Stop Reset, so you can get maximum value, head to Apple Podcasts, make sure you're subscribed and give us five stars. Make a comment on what you heard from Amy you can take some action on. And I recommend you check out those suggestions. That's Amy Hackett Jones, and I will see you next time. You've just heard a great podcast. Want to start your own? Email jason at a podcastcompany.com.